Really? I just want you all to know how much it means to us that you're all here. Thanks to mom and dad. Beautiful. Just a perfect day. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy food and help us to do our part with kind words and loving deeds. Amen. Amen. It gets dark, we go home. Your next is the latest film-like substance to spew forth from indie horror director Adam Wingard. It's a typical home invasion slasher thriller horror movie. And luckily, Wingard didn't write the script. This guy did, Simon Barron. And I never thought I would say this, but I actually think I miss Adam Wingard's screenwriting. And the film stars a whole bunch of people who typically star in these types of movies, usually together. What's up with that? That's not a random attack. When I reviewed the ABCs of Death, go watch that video, I'll pause this one for you. I found Adam Wingard's Q is for Quack to be one of the best segments in that film, and looking back on it, it might actually be the best segment in the film, and I liked for the most part, his involvement in the VHS films. Uh, his wraparound in VHS 1 is probably the worst thing about VHS 1, and is mostly where all the complaints comes from. But the segment that he did in VHS 2 I thought was really good. The thing about the segment from VHS 2 is it is the weakest of that film, but if you put that segment in another movie, if you watch that segment on its own, it's actually not that bad. It only starts to look pale when you compare it to the other segments in that film, but it is pretty decent, it's serviceable. However, his full-length feature, Horrible Way to Die, is one of the worst films that I've ever seen, and it has a lot of the same problems that we're gonna talk about in your next, with characters that just don't feel real, they feel like characters in a movie, they don't actually feel like people, a weird oscillating tone that never really tells you how you're supposed to take the movie, how you're supposed to feel about the movie by the end of it. A lot of the same actors are in A Horrible Way to Die that you'll find in this movie. There's a lot of really bad camera work in A Horrible Way to Die with too much shaky cam, too much shallow focus, to the point where it actually starts to become almost visually repellent. It's just, it's disgusting to look at. And going off certain moments in A Horrible Way to Die, and going off kind of the overall tone and feeling of the segments that he did in the VHS films. I get an impression that Adam Wingard really likes to objectify women. Just look at his Tumblr. But your next for me, as I said in The ABCs of Death, was the film in which Adam Wingard could hopefully redeem himself in some way, hopefully present a case that he's actually a pretty decent filmmaker that he actually knows what he's doing. Uh, he fails miserably in that regard. I'm going to paraphrase the angry video game nerd here. You could consider this movie a mixed bag, but it's a mixed bag of piss and shit. However, this mixed bag of piss and shit does have some gems in it. This movie is basically a terrible cross between The Strangers, Home Alone, and Bay of Blood, and all of those films are more worth watching than this one. This movie is very conventional when it comes to both plot and structure. It has that typical and what I find to be rather annoying as a seasoned horror fan, death every 10 structure, which is basically a death every 10 minutes. Um, you see that in every fucking slasher movie. I've never really been a big slasher fan in general, and actually tropes like that are kind of the reason why I'm not a huge slasher fan. With this movie, most of the problems, they stem from the script. The script in this movie is terrible. It is really bad. It is not helped whatsoever by Adam Wingard's directing. Adam Wingard seems to have the complete inability to keep a camera still. He seems to have the complete inability to keep focus. He seems to have the complete inability to keep things in frame. I find this way of directing kind of amazing because you're supposed to be able to see things in a film. You're supposed to be able to easily tell what's going on visually. And it's just amazing to me that so many directors have adopted this terrible shaky cam way of filming everything that in 20 years, when this trend has died because 
it will, everyone is going to look back on these films and completely disregard them because they're visual messes. Here's a quick example of what this movie looks like visually. Just give me a second. It's getting to the point and it's actually so bad in this movie that people were snickering at the screen when it got particularly awful with the shaky cam. When the people who attend the Thursday night 10 p.m. screening are snickering at your film, you have completely lost your audience as a director. But on that token, maybe it's not such a bad thing that you really can't see what's going on because the acting and character in this movie are wildly inconsistent and downright confused. No one in this movie puts in a good performance or a consistently good performance. Uh, the only exception to this, I would say, is Joe Swineberg. He is the only one who's actually putting in what I would consider to be a decent performance in this film. With that said, his character sucks. All of the characters suck in this movie. All of the characters are completely annoying completely vapid and undesirable. You don't want to spend time with these people. It's the same thing I said about the canyons. It's the same thing I said about Frankenstein's army. It's the same thing I've said about a lot of fucking movies. Why is it that horror movie filmmakers, and especially slasher filmmakers, why do they constantly feel the need to make the characters just unpleasant, repellent, completely stupid, just doing brain dead things for the entire runtime. Like I mentioned, not only do you not want to spend time with the characters, but they don't actually come off as real people. It's actually kind of what I said about Sasha Gray in Would You Rather. When you're acting like that, it's just unnatural. People have emotions and they have more than just being an annoying idiot. Uh, and it's particularly bad in this movie because the intelligent characters in this movie actually start to contradict themselves and do dumb things. Very early on in this movie, it is mentioned by the final girl in the film that they shouldn't go down in the basement because they could pump gas down there and just light a match or whatever. But throughout the film, they keep going down in the basement. And the entire time I kept thinking, hey, wait a minute, didn't you say at the beginning that's a bad idea to keep going down there? Why do you keep going down there? And it's funny because every time someone goes down there, they usually end up getting killed. So why the fuck do people still go down in the basement in this movie? And it's actually kind of shocking how short-sighted these characters are. Um, a lot of them just try to run out the door and, and get out of the house as fast as they can. And you know, as you can imagine, it leads to their death faster than if they hadn't have left. It's actually kind of shocking that none of the characters could figure out what was going on in this movie, that none of them saw the very obvious and blatant twist coming, and just none of it. The characters acting like annoying, vapid assholes, the characters just being completely brain dead. None of it gives you really a reason to care about any of them. When you can't care about the characters, then why the fuck should you care about the movie? Why should you care about the plot? Why should you care about the drama and what's happening? You know, I don't really care about the people that it's happening too, so really why do I care where things are going? But there are some scenes, particularly the dinner scene before the people start attacking the house, that is actually pretty good. You get the sense that this is actually like a real dysfunctional family and these characters actually are assholes in real life. So they would really be acting this way in this house. It doesn't make the film better, but for one scene, the characters being terrible people worked. But all of these issues all of these flaws, they basically come directly from the script. And this is gonna be a pretty interesting exercise right now because I'm going to defend Adam Wingard's work in this movie. And again, he didn't do a very good job with this movie, but I'm going to defend some of his work in this movie against the problems with the script. Throughout this movie, there are some tense moments. There are some moments that really do work, that are really effective. And it's because it balances out the tone, the visuals, the music, and just everything perfectly. And those scenes felt like Adam Wingard was trying to pull quality out of a script that had none. And for every good, suspenseful, tense moment, the movie will immediately follow that up with something completely stupid, with something completely brain dead. The characters saying or doing something that is just, like broadsides you with how dumb it is. And it just keeps taking you out the movie and it just keeps making it impossible to engage with what's on screen. It completely kills the momentum of the movie right then and there. Like Superman Returns, 
or Man of Steel. And the funny thing is, Adam Wingard as a writer is actually better than this script. A Horrible Way to Die might be a bad movie, but it at least has some interesting ideas in it. At least has a pretty unique plot as I saw it. Um, it's not a good film, but the script for it is astronomically better than the script for Your Next. And ultimately, what Your Next is, is fundamentally not what A Horrible Way to Die was. What Your Next is, is the typical awful, cliched horror movie that perpetuates that stereotype that horror movies are just about dumb characters essentially walking into their own death scenes. And yes, there are a lot of horror movies that are like that. If you look at the law of averages, there would be more mediocre to bad movies out there than there would be good. And yes, a lot of mediocre to bad movies do do that. However, those movies are mediocre and bad for that. Those are terrible cliches, and when you keep including terrible cliches in your movie, by extension, your movie is terrible and cliched, which is what your next is. Where's A Horrible Way to Die? It had some unique ideas. It was more of a character story. A Horrible Way to Die was more about the psychology and the dread of the situation. It wasn't just about this horrible oscillating tone with these horrible cliched characters that just keep walking into their own deaths. I mean, honestly, did Cabin in the Woods change nothing? And there are lines of dialogue in this movie that honestly get very close to the type of dialogue that Kirsten Scott Thomas was delivering in Only God Forgives. Fuck me on this bed next to your dead mom. And it's the type of movie that, because it's not engaging, because I keep being pulled out of it because of the stupidity in it, I can't help but think about the creative process. I can't help but think about the writing and production meetings they had before this movie. And the problem is, this is what I get from this movie. With all of the references in this movie, and there are quite a bit, it comes across that they were really trying to create something that they thought would be either really cool or really iconic with this movie, and it falls flat on its face. It falls flat on its goddamn face. In the future, this film shouldn't be regarded as any high watermark for anything. It shouldn't be remembered for anything special. Um, it's really just a completely conventional, completely typical home invasion film with twists that you see coming like a goddamn freight train from miles away. Uh, it, it offers nothing new. It offers nothing really compelling either. None of the characters are really compelling or engaging. They're just very dumb. Uh, except for the lead final girl who is for some reason survivor woman. Uh, I guess, whatever. But it just, it doesn't work. This movie doesn't work. This movie isn't good. Uh, I would not recommend it. Um, but is there any good in it? Uh, Joe Swanberg puts in a good performance, uh, for the most part. There are some tense moments here and there. The effects are good. Uh, the opening scene has Larry Fassendine in it, who is this really cool indie horror producer and director who's done some really good movies and appeared in some really good movies. Uh, I would highly recommend any Larry Fassendine movie over this movie in a heartbeat. And in the opening scene with Larry Fassendine, there's an instance where there's no title card in the movie. Instead, there's a moment where uh, you get a shot of a window that's covered in blood that says you're next. I really liked that. I really like when a movie can in some physical way incorporate the title into the movie. Not that the title has something directly related to something in the movie, but like what you see in a Wes Anderson film where like the title is actually on some physical object in the movie itself. I like that. That's cool. The same thing happens in Apocalypse Now. And speaking of cameos from cool independent horror movie directors or producers, T. West has a role in this film. He's in about five minutes of this film and his character doesn't really matter overall, but I just like to see T. West in movies in general. He's a cool guy. Maybe he should have been the one to direct this film.
so this movie, You're Next, I certainly can't recommend it. I really can't even recommend Adam Wingard as a director, but watch American Mary. Not that it has anything to do with your next, not that it shares any sort of plot similarities or actors or producers or any filmmakers or anything like that. It's just a really cool, interesting horror movie that came out this year that actually has a plot. It actually has character motivations. It actually has some pretty interesting ideas. This movie doesn't. Or if you actually do want to watch a movie that's like Your Next, then watch The Strangers. Or if you want to watch a movie that has similar twists to Your Next, then watch Bay of Blood. Uh, there are so many films that are like this movie that are so much better. Don't waste your time. Now we go from one invasion film to another. And we're back. Just like the five musketeers. Three musketeers, innit? Well, nobody knows how many there were, really, do they? You know that the three musketeers is a fiction, right? Written by Alexander Dumas. A lot of people are saying that about the Bible these days. What, that it was written by Alexander Dumas? Oh, don't be daft, Steve. It was written by Jesus. We were there, yeah? Let's do this! The World's End is the final part in the so-called Cornetto Trilogy, from best friend British filmmakers Edgar Wright, Simon Pegg, and Nick Frost. Tonight, they're returning to their hometown to finish the ultimate pub crawl. This is our chance to finally conquer the Golden Mile. Twelve pubs, twelve pints. And this time, they're going to make it to the last pub, the World's End. Let's go! And like Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz, it stars Peg and Frost, this time along with Patty Constantine, Martin Friedman, and Eddie Marson, as five friends who begrudgingly agree to relive their glory days and take on a massive pub crawl. Gary. Welcome. Bienvenue. Welcome. Well, it's weird, isn't it? You come back and everything's sort of different. But soon they discover that things might not be as they appear in their rural hometown. Come home, boys. It's not us that's changed, it's the town! Now, to begin with, I think my feelings towards Edgar Wright are pretty easy to guess. I do have a Scott Pilgrim poster right here. Uh, I really think Edgar Wright is a very talented filmmaker. I think he's particularly a very gifted writer. Him and Sam and Peg together are very talented and very gifted when they work together on a script. Uh, this is evident when you look at the result of what happened with the movie Paul. Paul is a good film, but it's lacking something, and I think that what that something is, is that extra like push that Edgar Wright gives everything that he's involved in. That extra little bit of magic is kind of what I would describe Edgar Wright's and what he puts into films. He puts sort of like a magic that you don't see in other movies. And it's not that he can craft a really great film in the proper way that you're supposed to make a film. It's not just that. It's some, there's something else. But I think what that extra something is, is in some way indescribable, but it's that sort of magical feeling about a movie that you feel when you're a kid, that sense that the movie is much grander and much more special than you feel about a movie when you're older because over time you learn the mechanics of a film, you understand somewhat the process of filmmaking, and it's no real secret anymore. There's production diaries, there's behind the scenes footage, commentary tracks, like you could find out anything you'd want to find out about filmmaking very easily nowadays. So the magic is kind of gone, and certainly for adults, it, it, I don't think you really feel that anymore. But maybe that's what Edgar Wright's great talent is, is he's able to replicate that uh, otherworldly, ethereal feeling that you get from watching a great film as a child, uh, but as an adult, you feel that as an adult when you're watching one of his movies. That probably is the gift that he has as a filmmaker. It's Again, it's an ethereal thing, it's just not easy to describe or explain, but he definitely has that gift. And of course, being an Edgar Wright fan, that does mean that I am a fan of the first two Coronetto movies, the first two films in the Coronetto trilogy. I, I will admit that I'm not as big of a fan of Hot Fuzz. I There's something about Hot Fuzz that I just kind of rubs me the wrong way. It's a little bit darker than I like, but I'm a huge fan of all just the over-the-top references to all of the different action movies, especially Point Break 
it, it's a really fun, it's a really entertaining movie. I love the local Shakespearean actors, that is great. I love Bill Knightley in that movie. I love Bill Knightley in the Coronado trilogy overall. But just Hot Fuzz, it, it slightly missed the mark when compared to Shaun of the Dead. And Shaun of the Dead is overall probably a complete masterpiece as a horror comedy, as a romantic comedy, as just a movie overall. Shaun of the Dead should be watched constantly by everyone all the time. Uh, maybe not that much, but it should be watched often. If you're a fan of horror comedy, if you're a fan of Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg and the Coronado trilogy overall, it's the best movie in the trilogy. Even with the world's end, it's still the best movie in the trilogy. It's probably the best movie from Edgar Wright. Uh, the second being Scott Pilgrim, and I'm not going to move from that position. But because these films are their own enclosed individual stories, and because they can be looked at as their own movies as a whole, I wasn't particularly amped up for this film. I didn't, like, hype myself up for it. I, it's not that I wasn't looking forward to it, it's just I wasn't gonna buy into the hype of, oh, it's the last part of the Cornello trilogy, I gotta, you know, it's gonna be awesome, it's gonna be great. It's like, no, it's just another movie by Edgar Wright, it has Simon Pegg, and it has Nick Frost, and hopefully it will be very good, which it was. It didn't disappoint. Everything about this movie is good. Uh, it's really fun. It's really funny. It's extremely entertaining. It has a really interesting story at times, really interesting theme at times. It has a bit of an odd ending, which I want to get into a little bit, but this movie is pretty fantastic. It has that energetic and inventive directing style from Edgar Wright. It's, you know, as I mentioned, really magical, really special, really fantastic. The movie just looks great. The camera work in particular is just amazing. The fight scenes in this movie, uh, the camera work is very reminiscent of what you would find in The Raid or even the first Kick-Ass film. And the, the, like, just the camera work during the fight scenes in this movie is just completely spectacular. It has that completely just airtight Brian De Palma-esque editing style. And technically, if you were gonna give an award for any most valuable players of this movie, on a technical level, the editing is the best thing about this movie. It is so good. I love the editing in this movie. The editing is just, it's perfect. And I think, as to be expected, the acting in this movie is just, it's great from everyone. It's really heartfelt. And the thing that I really liked about Simon Pegg in this movie is he's playing against his typical type. He's kind of an asshole in this movie. He's kind of a giant asshole. He keeps repeating the same mistakes. He keeps doing the same bullshit over and over again. He's just a complete self-centered, selfish dick to all of his friends. He's actually pretty much like the complete opposite of the character that he played in Hot Fuzz. The character that he played in Hot Fuzz was much more straight-laced, much more buttoned down. Whereas this character is just a complete mess. He's just a complete alcoholic, a complete drug addict, a complete, uh, just complete asshole, just a complete douchebag. But he's a lovable douchebag. He's, he's a douchebag that you want to call your friend. And that's the thing about this movie is these characters, they feel like your friends and you care for them like they, they are your friends. And you care for them like they are your friends. Now, as I said, when Simon Pegg and Edgar Wright are working on a script together, I think they deliver really spectacular work. I think they are really gifted when they're working together. Uh, with that said, I think the script in this movie has a couple issues at the beginning with the setup. It's just, it's really quick and it's a lot of information and you have to very much pay attention. Fair warning, please pay attention in the first 10 minutes of this movie. It's a very quick uh, first 10 minutes and there's a lot of information that you need to know throughout the film because it doesn't really give you much setup beyond that. It just gets directly to the pub crawl. So don't be texting and pay attention. So of course I would highly recommend this film, but for a couple minutes I just want to get into the themes and a little bit into the ending. So you could conceivably turn this video off right now, but I wouldn't recommend it. For me, these films have always been about some sort of a new paradigm, uh, be it a good or a bad one, trying to assimilate or even take control of humanity, and stuck in the middle of it is like kind of a schlubby guy who's in a life rut who has to win the day with the help of his merry band of like weird friends. And typically the main character and the story come full circle and whatever flaw that the main character had is usually conquered and he usually also gets the girl. Um, it's a very classic story, it's very Star Wars. And in that regard, I kind of think it's similar to Hot Fuzz because in Hot Fuzz, the cultists basically just wanted like an immaculate life 
for themselves and for their community. While the robots that aren't robots in the world's end, they just want everyone to be nice. They just want everyone to be pacifist. Oh, not that guy. And the movie ties all of that into themes related to the oncoming technological collapse that will hit us once we run out of the dwindling resources that we have to support the technology that we use. You know, I'm doing it right now with my camera and with my computer. You're doing it right now by watching this video. Uh, it'll hit us and it will be bad and it will bring us back to before the Industrial Revolution. And this movie plays on that. And this is where I'm gonna get into the ending a bit. So once the characters have dispatched the evil uh, overlord of the robots that aren't robots, basically all of the technology on Earth dies. All of the technology is completely destroyed. And we are brought back to a period before the Industrial Revolution. And it's a bit of a downer. Uh, I'm not necessarily sure if it works, given the tone of the rest of the film. But the thing is, it kind of signifies that Edgar Wright is willing to take a giant risk with the end of his movie and just be like, hey, fuck it. And just completely turn everything on its ear and turn the movie into something else entirely. Uh, that I appreciate greatly in a filmmaker. It's a, another reason why I love Edgar Wright as a filmmaker because he does take risks like that. Uh, Edgar Wright, uh, curiously enough, is the reason why I saw Steven Spielberg's Tintin movie. Uh. And with that, of course, the main character doesn't really change at all. He just kind of stays the giant asshole that he was the entire time. And the thing is, I really liked that. I liked that, you know, they took a risk and they just made the character stay a douchebag. It was good. I really appreciate what Edgar Wright did with this film. I really loved this movie. It was very entertaining. It's gonna be uh, probably on my list of the best movies of the year. What are you doing? It's all right, I'm not trying to have sex with you. There's something I need to tell you right now. Unless you do want to have sex, in which case I'll tell you afterwards. Tell me right now. What did you say, sir? Newton Haven has been taken over by robots. Did you believe him? She can head back to London. A, we're all drunk. B, we've got blood on our hands. It's more like ink. We've got ink on our hands. Ah! From the creators of Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz. Let's climb down the drain pipe. I got a better idea. Climb down the drain pipe. The only way to survive the night what? is to make it all the way to the world's end. Where are the others? They're blending in. Hello, I am a robot. We're just five friends on a night out, <laughs> having a good time. And what's probably best about this film, what is probably the greatest thing about the world's end, and what is probably the greatest thing about Edgar Wright's filmography as a whole, is that all of those films understand what it is to be a film and understand what is needed to be a film and what you need to do to deliver a satisfying experience. And all of these movies have been more than satisfying, more than entertaining. And again, I would just highly recommend this movie, highly recommend all of the Cornetto trilogy. I kind of can't wait to watch all of these movies back to back to back. Uh, that'll be fun. The World's End. Is that? We are gonna get to the world's end if it kills us. Oh no. Never watch your next.